Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Grocer, Mercatus's very own podcast. Season four, episode three. I'm really excited. And joining me, as always, is my faithful, faithful co-host, Mark Fairhurst, our VP of Marketing. Mark, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. You know, it's it's kind of an interesting show because it's our first time in a long time where we're actually doing a show without a guest. Without a guest. Um, and and un, this is basically you and me unfiltered. <laughs> Was it ever filtered before? <laughs> well, I think we always had a structure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have some ideas yeah. about what we want to talk about, but this this is... This is us ripping it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like one of those things where the industry is just changing by leaps and bounds on a on I I used to say quarterly basis. It used to be years ago to be on an annual basis. Somebody would yeah. come out with something innovative, and then you'd go to a trade show, you'd see it, and then it miraculously would die on the vine for some reason. And now it's like there are innovations happening in this space that are being kind of spurred by the pandemic. So we're seeing. It now occur on a daily basis. There's a yep. tremendous amount of news that's kind of filtering down to us through the trades uh, and through um, yeah the tech space. Quite frankly, yeah, it's coming fast and furious. I mean, it's it used to be that we had a, a planned program for these shows, right. but now it's it, the new as you said, the news is happening so fast. It's pushing us to uh, to expound on these these or at least comment on what's happening very, very a lot faster than we anticipated. Yeah, and it's a kind of interesting, Mark, you and I were talking about this last week in one of our, you know, late evening telephone calls, and, you know, I made the, <laughs> my God. Much, much to your wife and my wife. So. Yeah, my wife says, you know, you see Mark Fahers more than you see me, this <laughs> was before the pandemic, folks, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's kind of odd, you know, I said to Mark, I said, I have this interesting feeling, and I don't think this is wrong or or." Or, or right. I mean, I mean, I think it's, I think it quite frankly, it may be a good thing. Uh, in some cases, it's like the dominant tech players in the space are kind of coming in. I want, I don't want to say taking over grocery, but I think they're coming in to rescue grocery. To a certain yeah, that, extent. that's, that's an interesting perspective. It's, it's, um, they're certainly bringing a, a different dynamism dynamism to the yeah. to the industry. Yeah. yeah. Well, we were on that that you know the whole um, webinar yesterday with the folks from Incisive and Insight yeah. Media, and that you know there was my uh, myself, Jack Record over from Shopper Kit, and Jeff yeah. Baskin over from uh, Flyby, and you know one of the questions that kind of came out is, and it came from an, an audience member, is is delivery ever going to be ever going to be profitable and then there was the whole question about labor management and that jack did a really great job in tackling and kind of jeff jumped in on you know how do you make sure that your that last moment of of that interaction with the consumer where you're giving them the stuff that they're coming to get in on on a curbside pickup scenario is really you know seamless and smooth they had great arguments then you know the question that came to me was well what about service fees and you know, I, I I answered I answered the question in a way that was like, I think retailers in this day and age today are caught where they were twenty years ago. And Mark, you may have lived through mm-hmm. this, but I remember twenty years ago when I worked for a research company, a lot of retailers were struggling how to compete against Walmart, mm-hmm. and they were trying to compete against Walmart on price, which which is basically nuts it's nuts and you just yeah. it's it's you just can't do it it makes absolutely no sense to do something like that you just don't have the buying power and you can't you can't spread it across the the store footprint that walmart can well absolutely and you're right because if you're a grocery retailer and you're not gen- dealing with general merchandise you don't have that bump up in margin to be mm-hmm. able to do that so you're dealing in, in the world of one to three percent mm-hmm. you know if you're a whole foods maybe six percent yeah you know it used to be six percent not sure what it is today, but the reality is, is that when you think of service fees and, you know, retailers are asking us today, clients and non-clients saying, you know, I don't want to charge service fees to my customers because Walmart down the street is, you know, not charging any, but hey, whoa, hold on here. Like, you know, they can make that up in their, in their margin. You can't. Right. So you got to be strategic in thinking, 
well, hey, if my average basket is $84, is that a profitable basket as it is today? And chances are it may not be. Do I just set a threshold? Hey, if you buy $100 or you buy $95, then maybe I won't charge you uh, a service fee. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the the proliferation of last mile uh, delivery providers, mm. I mean, definitely in the last three or four years, consumers will pay for convenience. Not every consumer will, right? but but a segment of your shopper base will. Sure, sure. And listen, I pay, I do pay Sobe $7.99 yeah. for every delivery that comes in. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I, you know, and I'm not just saying this because I can afford it. I pay $10.99 because the service is that good and the web experience is is really that good. Yeah. And I think Sobeys has done a really good job. And again, this goes back to our thesis. I think big tech is coming in to rescue gro grocery to a certain extent. Sobeys is leaning heavily on Ocado. 100%. So, to support them. And in Canada, you know, our choices, our choices here are, are fairly limited. You know, you have Instacart. We definitely have Corner Shop with Uber. Right. Right. Yeah. So they've cut deals with um, Longos. I believe they've cut a deal with Metro mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the local pharmacies. Yeah. And some of the big brands as well. So they're they're kind of doing that. And then you have um, Voila by Soe's. And then you, you have some choice with depending on where you live with uh, President's Choice or Loblaw. Right. That's about it. It's not like where if you were in, in the U.S. right now where you would have a ton more of options in terms of how you want your food delivered. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think retailers are now kind of looking to Silicon Valley and saying, how do we get better at this? Can you help us? Can you partner with us? I think. Yeah, uh, and 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 I, de I definitely think that bringing in the uh, the technology companies is raising the game for some retailers. Right. Um, other retailers are just in a quandary as to uh, what what they should be doing and who should they be partnering with. We're so you know we're uh, this is a big crazy question. We read about this. We don't talk about yeah. it. We don't talk about it on our show. Yeah. Were retailers dismissive that this day would come? No, that, that's a great question. Um, actually, I was just having a conversation with someone earlier uh, today. You know, it's, I think as, as a species, we become tunnel vision. Right. We just get used to doing the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it takes a uh, an external shock, something to really jolt us out of our way of doing things mm -hmm. like, like the pandemic right? Um, to get those lateral thinkers to actually grasp on, onto new modes and ways of thinking and operating. And I think this, you know, if you look at the grocery industry, this definitely is that catalyst, but I also think there's, there will be a group of retailers who just can't make that leap. Yeah. And, and what I get concerned about is if, if you think back to, the financial crisis of 08. And this yeah. is, this is entirely. We've, talk, we've talked about this. Yeah, and this is entirely different. Yeah, we talked about this late at night. Yeah. Um. You know, in 08, what we saw is is a trade down effect and a trade out effect, right? So if you were shopping at Dean and Deluca and you you lived in South Park, Charlotte, North Carolina, which is an affluent area in that gated community by this really nice Dean and Deluca, and you lost your job at uh, um, Wells Fargo or Bank of America, which we know b and A had a tremendous amount of layoffs in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. I mean, I was at ground zero the, the day it happened. It was just brutal. I was staying at the Omni downtown. I was working for, uh, for food, <coughs> food line in, in Salisbury. And suddenly you can't go to Dean and DeLuca. Okay. So your, yeah. your next bet is you're going to a local Harris Teeter. You're going to a food line. It's okay. So if you can't ex for those, you're trading down into a bottom dollar foods, maybe a Walmart, and guess what? If you can't afford those two at that point, 
you know, maybe you're going to a dollar store for canned food. Maybe you're supplementing with, you know, with government subsidies or you're going over to a food bank. And that gets really scary. Now, the, the challenges that we see is, you know, when the economy rebounded, people went back into their regular habits, right? And, you know, for the, for the most part. But the reality is now is you have two effects. You have people, yes, that they've lost their job and they, and we know that the snappy BT program uh, subscription rates are through the roof in the United States. Right. Right. And so at that point you have people that are probably trading down and trading out, but you have people now for safety reasons. This is the kicker here. Laterally shifting. Yep. Right. Yep. And this, and in our research, the the uh, report that we recently published shows this online loyalty right. is a fraction of what it is for brick and mortar. Right. So there's so there's a third element here, and this was a this was an amazing. Um, I don't want to call it a debate. It was a conversation that you and I had with the uh, analyst team over at Goldman's mm -hmm. on on Friday out of New York. I think we had some. I know we had someone from New York dialing in. And in London England, as well. In London, yeah. England. Is we're getting a lot of reports from retailers that trade dollars have dried up or are non existent yeah. to a certain extent. And what I mean, like trade and co op dollars, dollars that are given by the merchant or the CPG over to the merchant they're negotiating with. Okay, the dirty word slotting fees, mm -hmm. placement in the flyer, the coupon, the floor graphic the discounts, the whatever the trading co-op dollars are imagined. And we know, we know this for a fact, there are a lot of retailers out there that they, those dollars are very important. They're important to do the category manager because they may be tied to their compensation, their bonus plan, to demonstrate profitability of their category and to a retailer, quite frankly, simply for survivability. Well, yeah, and, and you've said to me in the past, I mean, this is the difference between a retailer being profitable, yes, with a one or two percent margin, absolutely, and that, and and then uh, actually being in the negative yeah. for for an annual uh, yeah. for a year or more. Yeah, and and you know we've waited, call it fourteen, fifteen years to do it to do uh, to bolt in an ad network into our solution until we knew that a we weren't going to go affect the trade and co-op budgets, and that we were simply going to go up to towards maybe. The above the line media dollars that mm -hmm. had been shifting to digital. And that's why we waited so long because we didn't want to be part of a, a group that was going to cannibalize that. So now you have this pandemic effect where people are yep. trading down, trading out, and then laterally shifting into e commerce. And quite frankly, not remaining necessarily loyal to their key retailer because they're looking for a retailer that has availability of stock, availability of time slots for either pickup or delivery. Yeah. Now you combine this third variable, which is the reality of trading co-op dollars that are are drying up, and you know the the talk on the street from a lot of the CPGs is, hey, listen, you know we're we're experiencing woes on our side on the man on in manufacturing. We need those extra dollars to cover that. Um, there is a shortage of certain raw materials, quite frankly, and then we're hearing shortage of aluminum because there was a spike on uh, on pedal bikes. And so now there's not a lot of aluminum for... <laughs> you bought one. I know you did. I did. And you have, you know, there's a lack now of aluminum for cans and uh, the trade tra tariffs. Anyways, it kind of gets well, complicated even, for no reason. Even appliances. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stoves, dishwashers. Yeah. You're on waiting lists. So you're on waiting lists. So, so now you have this lack of availability of these trade dollars and, you know, Yesterday, Progressive Grocer did a, um, a great reporting on how retailers like Walmart and, mm -hmm. and Amazon and many others are building out their digital practices, their digital ad networks. Yeah. Much like what we did, and we're supporting at least three of our retailers in doing this. Yeah. And my fear is you're going to see an increase in bankruptcy in grocery retail in the smaller tiers where they weren't ready for e-commerce they may have lost so you know they succumb to the three variables 
Number one is they've lost consumers that are trading out. Number two, they've lost uh, lost consumers, I should say, not retailers. They've lost consumers that are trading, laterally shifting to their competitor because they do e-commerce much better or right. they just do it. Yep. And then suddenly you don't have access to the trade funds anymore. And because, because the traditional spend has now gone digital. Yeah, it absolutely has. Well, it's yeah. it's gone digital. I think it's gone. The dollars are being spent in home and digital. Yeah. Right. So when I mean in home, I'm talking about TV. Mm -hmm. Right. So TV spends and digital spends and and CPG users have always said and you know Mark you went to uh, I can't remember the firm that we used to work with but we used to be able to go attend these great events on a monthly basis. Yeah, it'll come back to me anyways. Um, and when we had chats with the folks, the senior team over at Heinz, um, you've chatted with the folks over at Nestle and yep. so on. And, and CPGs have always said, hey, we can get distribution. Distribution's not difficult for us. You know, we can, we can buy a run of Facebook, a run of, you know, keywords or, you know, an Instagram, whatever. It's, it's conversion that they want. The ability to influence you at the moment of your about to click on something mm -hmm. and quite frankly as human beings we are you know in the 70s we used to be bombarded on average 400 to 700 times a day with advertisement in this day and age it's north of 10,000 a day so if you're a cpg and you want to make that spend go go spend it on on a platform where people <laughs> are buying yeah other, otherwise you're you're going to be immersed in a lot of noise it's where to your point, the conversion, uh, the ability to influence the shopper at, at the moment they're purchasing is, is going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is just going to be the norm, um, quite frankly, moving forward. And I, well, I dread what's going to happen with the industry. Well, and, and you know, that gets to a, something we may want to talk about. It's once the, once the artificial inflation of top line sales for grocers dissipates mm. or goes away after the pandemic, um, you know, what happens to these retailers when they don't have that extra revenue to rely on? Our thesis is that the wave of bankruptcies um, will be much bigger than what we're anticipating or anybody would be anticipating. So that leaves what? That leaves you with the large right. uh, national tier one retailers those tier two retailers that were strategic in their thinking and being able to um, stand up an experience that is differentiated at the same time as you have these new technology players coming into the space. Right. You, you mentioned the Okados of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, this is where the team at Okado didn't agree. Um, you know, they had a, uh, so the team at Goldman had this thesis, which was, can retailers leverage, and I look up here because I'm just thinking, um, mm -hmm. can re retailers leverage media dollars, digital media dollars to offset costs and, and, and so on? And uh, my argument to them, potentially, because you, you, you have to be mindful of your, you know, your labor costs, your picking, packing, and your so on. And there's, there's, there's so many factors. And my answer to them was, not every retailer will be able to pull this off. Today, right. Right. That's number one. Number two is I wanted to encourage them to think about this third variable that we just mentioned, which is, hey, if those in-store trade dollars are eroding and no longer going, this becomes an issue. And this has been the, and you know, the dirty secret of the industry has always been that 50% of any given marketing budget is spent on the print flyer. And, and I will hear the arguments day in and day out that it is the best customer acquisition tool that retailers have. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. The reason I don't agree with that, like Layla Kasha, the CMO at Grocery Outlet, she's a beacon. She doesn't yeah. do flyers. Yeah. And this is a, she's a seasoned executive. I met her when she was originally at Sprouts Farmers Markets, and then she went, she went over to the Safemark company in Modesto. And now she knows she's worked her way up the corporate ladder to become uh, an extremely powerful CMO. 
And Grocery Outlet has a unique business model in any case. But, uh, you know, she's taking her flyer dollars and she's put them into digital. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Harris Teeter, I think their flyer is like one page. And so now you have, I, I feel bad for the printing companies who are going to lose a bunch of revenue. But, you know, that 50% is not just printing costs. It's the people that you need to build out those flyers. And they are complicated. They're not easy. Um, and surprisingly enough, I haven't looked at Flip and see how they're doing as a business because of that. But anyways, maybe if I have a few minutes, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all interesting stuff. So Goldman is, I know that they were having, the London team was having conversations with Tesco uh, and uh, Ocado. Yeah. Uh, to kind of get their thoughts on this. We know that Ocado, you know, has stopped reporting the amount of money that they take in from uh, digital ad revenue. And I think the team at Goldman will really wanted to find out, is it a case that you're just not reporting it anymore? Or is it just because, you know, you've lost those dollars? So they're supposed to be coming out with a positioning. Um, sorry, you mean the team at Tesco? At Tesco, sorry. Yeah. yeah and Kroger's, Kroger's done the same. Kroger has done the same. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So I'm interested to see what the team at Goldman's going to come out with as a positioning paper, which I believe will be available sometime in November. And hopefully we'll have access to it to be able to share it out to the group. Now, speaking of Ocado, I was just I was just going to go here. Yeah. Yes. The perfect segue. There you go. <laughs> so I'm going to let you spill the beans. Well, it, it came out uh, about a week ago that um, Auto Store, which is the Norwegian based uh, robotics company that we know pretty well. And we've had um, Andrew Benzinger on our show. We've talked a few times about it. Auto Store is, uh, is suing uh uh, Ocado for patent infringement. Right, right. It's interesting because if you've had, ever been involved in any form of, of litigation, and you know, I've 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 been through my fair share of, of litigation and uh, going after people that are infringing on on my intellectual property and my company's intellectual property, um, as well as defending. You know, you right. know the, the first incarnation of Mercatus was Springboard Retail Networks, where we designed a computer that goes on a shopping cart, which, you know, we own a tremendous amount of IP, not just design, but also methodology yep. patents and software patents. And, you know, now we know that Amazon's got a cart that's out there. And there's Casper, who has this other type of player, flavor of a cart. And, you know, we're not patent trolls and there's a way and there's a process to be able to kind of follow if you're, you want to go down the road of protecting your IP. What I find in, interesting in this case here um, between AutoStore and Ocado is the reality is in North America right now, Ocado has two exclusive relationships. Mm -hmm. First one in Canada with Sobeys. Yep. Which kind of bars them from doing business with any other retailer in Canada. And it, Okay, let's be honest here. In Canada, the only other suitor that would make sense would be potentially Walmart Canada, which I doubt that would occur. Yeah, and we know that Walmart in the U.S. at least is working with um, Alert Innovations, correct? Which is which is an auto store type mm -hmm. of, um, provider, right? And then you have uh, in the United States, Kroger. Mm -hmm. So what we don't know yet out of this case. Will this put a kibosh on um, Sobeys in Canada rolling out its its second um, CFC in Montreal? And will it uh, prevent Kroger from doing the same? So we don't know if there's been, you know, with this lawsuit, a cease and desist in terms of rolling out any technology. I think the, right. the reality hasn't been privy to a lot of litigation and sat in on some of these matters, some of my own, some of some with others. It is always in the best interest of the of the plaintiff to allow the defendant to continue generating revenue with the view that, hey, if your deem is infringing, then I have a right to that revenue. Right? That's the first the first thing. Yeah. I don't know. Do you, so what do you think Auto Store's endgame is here? It's tough to say because, you know, on one side, you know, Cotto has put himself to get into the North American market, has gone ahead and signed an exclusive arrangement. 
right. with two of the largest players. And it's, chances are it's not a lifetime exclusivity. It may be a timed exclusivity. Right. So giving them the opportunity to prove out their technology, work out the kicks in the North American market, and then hopefully use that as a kind of a, a, a beacon to be able to get more clients. Right. But at the same time, if it drums up enough interest in, in MFC technology or CFC technology, this is a great opportunity for the companies like AutoStore to be able to, to, to jump into the market. And, and to go ahead and take all the other retailers that, you know, Ocado won't be able to work with. You know, you can think of, I don't know, Publix. I mean, I, yep. the list goes on. I mean, I don't know who they're working with. but well, Yeah, we, we know that Auto Store has an agreement with HEB. I don't think it's um, rolled out yet, but I think that was recently announced. But you're right. I mean, there, there, is, there is that tier of retailers that they could use as part of their um, addressable market. Yeah, I, I, this is tough to say, but if in one previous experience that I've had where we were approached by a um, US-based holding company, mm -hmm. uh, basically represented by a law firm, I won't call them, I won't necessarily call them a patent troll, but they they came aggressively after us under the under the guise that we were potentially infringing on some of their technology, uh, which we ended up subsequently kind of uh, settling with them and licensing a bunch of things. Yep. But in the conversations with them, what became apparent is the family that owned the portfolio really wanted out of managing the portfolio. <laughs> and they were really, they were actually, they offered for us, they wanted to know if we would buy the portfolio. Interesting. And, and buy everything out. And, and, so when you become a patent troll, just or, as everyone's never done this, <clears throat> so let me just give you uh, a uh, Sylvain Perrier's 101 <laughs> in, in patent trolling. <laughs> we have we have the episode title now. Yeah, we do. Patent trolling 101 with, with the <laughs> folks over at Mercatus. Most popular show ever. Most, yeah, probably. <laughs> It'll surpass Brit and Lad's show. That's right. So, so the... Um, what you do, let's assume, let's assume you have a portfolio, more than just one patent, like one, one's never enough. You, what you normally do is there is a series of, of technology slash um, law firms that are very much specialized in this. And what you do is you, you bring to them your portfolio. And what they will do is they will assess the uh, potential of infringement mm -hmm. that's out there. So... Um, there was a couple of companies in Ottawa that were very, very, very skilled in the design of memory technology. And they amassed a massive portfolio and they eventually stopped making memory technology and became quote, quote unquote their own troll. And it's not, not a nice word, but basically I mean, they're defending their rights. Mm -hmm. So what you do is once they're done the assessment, if they think there's value in this, they will set up a limited liability company. You transfer your intellectual property into the hands of that li limited liability company. It is co-owned by the owners of the IP and as well as the firm representing. And any money that they get out from going after getting licensing fees and so on is used to pay down first and foremost the legal costs and then post that whatever's left is split mm -hmm. depending on the arrangement you have it this is not necessarily a 50 50 split it can be you know 80 20 it doesn't really matter but that's typically how it works now what they don't tell you and this is the assessment you have to make as a quote unquote someone who wants to defend their own intellectual property is you have to be very much prepared to have your name sullied. And what that means is, you know, if I look at, you know, the 35 plus patents that I'm on, my name's on it. And I'm not dead, I'm very much alive. You know, I woke up this morning, I'm like, oh, I have a pulse. <laughs> so that's really what, what sticks with people, you know, and that's that's the reputation loss of becoming becoming a patent troll. But, I mean, it's, I mean first of all, I appreciate the, the education. Um, Secondly, I'm glad you pronounced Ottawa not the way Tucker Carlson does. How does he pronounce it? <laughs> he doesn't. It's Ottawa oh or some, some bizarre pronunciation. 
Uh, but but thirdly, you know, that begs the question. Yeah. And this goes back to, you know, what is Auto Store? I mean, because you got to think if Auto Store is going after Ocado, the biggest fish, they've got fabric, you know, they've got takeoff technologies, uh, they've got alert innovations, everyone playing in the same space mm. that they could they could go after. Alternatively, you know, this for Ocado, I think the simplest thing would be just to buy Auto Store. It could be. They may could very very well be the case. It's an odd way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, let yeah. me see you, then let me ask you to buy me. But like, yeah, I I've I've seen those things materialize in, in the past, right? If if you can't if you can't join them, try to beat them some way to, to market. And I just I find it odd because um I try to dig up the uh the initial filings of the case and I'm, I don't mm -hmm. want to pay two thousand dollars to our legal counsel to kind of dig it up for me so i can read it but listen i think this this will this will all get settled this will not because here here's what's going to happen so immediately okado's legal counsel in the uk and the uk has a very strong ip process mm -hmm. it would be immediately digging up first and foremost. So when you go and patent, you, you, you go through the patent feasibility process and a very strong lawyer and IP counsel will have dug up for you what potentially you may be infringing on to give the inventor the opportunity to circumvent. And if they felt that there's a risk of infringement, but there really isn't, the law firm would have issued letters of opinion of non-infringement so those are likely, if those exist, those are being shared. If they don't exist, then the biggest thing that Okada is going to have to do to put Auto Store on their back heels is go and submit um, an IP review process to determine, uh, to, to, to invalidate the IP. Right. And that just, I mean, if you're Auto Store, I'll tell you if that occurs, when we live through it in Canada watch. with research in motion, watch out, watch yeah. out because yep. the, the, the cost is significant. And if you're not closing deals, you're not making sales. Yep. And here's what I would hate. I would, I would caution when these things go this way, you have to have deep pockets and no grocery retailer wants to get in bed with a vendor. I think anyways, that is going through this. I've seen it. I've seen it so many times happen, and I just hope. I, I hope, and I yeah. pray that this will be resolved for those two companies. Yeah, I know. I respect both of them, and I think Britain Ladd is their chief marketing officer over at at the Auto Store now. Auto Store, yeah, yeah, a wonderful yeah. gentleman. He's a smart guy, um, you know. But I get it. Like they're defending their rights, and that's okay too, right? Yeah, yeah. It it, it, it is becoming increasingly complicated as the technology companies move more into to grocery speaking of which yeah uh, amazon oh my god i'd never say oh my like, god on a, on a podcast before <laughs> oh my god g-a-w-d <laughs> yes yes it is um well what was the news there well so it's the fact that they bought a percentage on the, of uh spartan nash stock mm -hmm. And it was disclosed. I mean, I wasn't aware. I think I don't know if the industry was aware that the Nash Finch side, the distribution side of Spartan Nash, was supplying, you know, Amazon. I think since 2016, 2015, 2016. Yeah, yeah. And they bought us. I think 14. I believe. Yeah, I think you round it rounded up to like 15, 15, but it's over for for Spartan. It's a it's a significant yeah. uh, investment. It is and much much higher than your typical. Um, supplier mm -hmm. and vendor or, or customer relationship right. uh, in the grocery space to secure a line of uh, a product yeah. of supply. Yeah. So that's, that's why I think eyebrows are being raised. They, yeah, they are like surprisingly enough, like, you know, we don't, we don't get to go to trade shows and hear the rumor mill anymore. So, you know, how, what's the reaction amongst, amongst the folks? I think the I think the reality is, you know, Amazon has always been a company that's not afraid to pay to learn mm -hmm. and and then to eventually eventually buy something. So, you know, I remember many years ago being in the Southwest, walking into a grocery store with um, a fellow client at the time, 
and I was surprised. I mean, there was tons of Amazon people running around and, and kind of made the comment. And I said, oh, this is, wow, you're working with Amazon. It's fairly risky because, you know, they have the culture that they will will learn and test and try things and then eventually make it their own. Are you, aren't, aren't you worried? No, we think it's a great partnership, blah, 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 blah. We're not having to use our, our labor and, and, and so on. Okay, that's, that's great. Well, you know, lo and behold, they turn around, they buy Whole Foods. I'm not suggesting that's going to happen in the case of Spark Nash. I think what Amazon, in my estimation, is, you know, if they really want to scale quickly in the world of grocery, buying or building stores is the least of their problems. It's it's that's the easy part, you know. And I know that the retailers <laughs> yeah. that are listening, Sly, you've never built a store, you don't know what it's like. Yeah, no, I've never built a store, but been in this space for almost 22 years, and I've talked to many of grocers that have shared their woes and the construction experts, and so on. The reality is, is Amazon's distribution network, as amazing as it is, as fast as it's going, you know, we know that they're building their second largest distribution center in Canada on the outskirts of Ottawa. Thank you, Tucker Carlson. Uh, <laughs> and they're going to be building another one here north of Toronto. Yeah. Um, Hog, Hogstown, as most people may not know. Um, it's not the same in those distribution centers. I can't see how do you do half general merchandise and then half frozen and yeah. and the logistics may- of carrying that stuff. I think you just go out and you just get someone to do it to let you scale fast. And then you come back, you figure it out, it's, and you partner more or you build your own. It's it's the same it's the same example re you know made new. Mm. Uh, that you just gave is the, they're learning the the fresh and uh, frozen and private to be honest private label uh, business in in grocery from uh, a distributor like Spartan Ash. Right, right. Well, you, you know, we I don't know who makes uh, Whole Foods private label. It might be Damon Worldwide over in Connecticut, super company. Mm-hmm. I mean, those those guys are embedded with a lot of the retailers. I mean, Kirk, the Kirkland brand for the most part, I think, is Damon. Uh, Mm -hmm. quite frankly I I think here's what I want to tell our listeners don't be dismissive of Amazon this isn't this isn't an experiment for them this is the reality there you know I we've said this on countless shows we've said this and we have rewritten about this in countless blog posts articles yeah yeah you know Household penetration rate for groceries, 98%. The baskets are larger now for the most part. Share of wallet is being concentrated with a few retailers because of the pandemic. And Amazon, if they can tap into that household penetration rate to feed into everything else that they do on the media side, on the whatever side, this is going to benefit them. Absolutely. And Absolutely. if you thought it was an experiment before they bought Whole Foods, the purchase of a Whole Foods should have taught you. If they, if you thought they weren't going to open their own stores, the store in Woodland Hills, California, should teach you what they can do. And, and I think, like when I when we when we decided the title for this show, to a certain extent, there's a lot of great Silicon Valley companies that are coming to the rescue of retailers to support them with true partnership and so on. But there are th- those like an Amazon that's just going to come to the table to crush and to dominate. And you know, I don't think, you know, I'm not sure how Amazon could they survive the trade down and trade out. I think a hundred percent because they have other assets that can fund their grocery business yep. to nauseam. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll deny to the cows come home sure. that they leverage other revenue streams from other lines of business. But in the reality is they do. I mean, I think the report that just came out of Congress on the big tech players, mm-hmm. um, definitely on, as far as Amazon is concerned, see it as, as a, as a, unfair advantage um yeah i retail so i watched that the whole the whole proceedings and you know i think tim cook got off light oh 
light. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I'm sure if he would have been there live, they would have hugged him. You know, it's Apple. <laughs> yeah. Like who doesn't like Apple? But yeah. I felt, you know, they, you have politicians that are not business and technology experts asking questions that are likely not even prepared by them and not giving the opportunity for the person they're asking the question to, 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 to give a valid answer. I don't think Jeff Bezos gets out of bed in the morning and says, I want to screw everyone in retail. I don't think that's the case. I think it's the reality is um, we, Capitalism is a great system, but we have a tendency when it gets too good for some to want to punish it. Yeah. And yeah. I don't agree. I don't, I, I subscribe to the idea of free markets and I can debate about this till, till the cows come home, till, till Jeff Bezos buys those cows. Right. <laughs> and, and we don't let these, we don't, he, he, he needs the milk. He need, well, he's going to. <laughs> But, That's you know, right. and because he's got to sell cheap. He's bananas. got all those stores. He's, he's got to sell cheaper bananas than Trader Joe's, which was like everyone was just shocked. Like, who would sell bananas cheaper than Trader Joe's? Like, come on. It's the free market. <laughs> this is yeah. the way this these things are supposed to work. And, you know, we, we tend to want to punish these people for kind of taking these bold moves and so on. Now. Um, there's also this notion of social responsibility, which I'm 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 kind of both sides of the coin. You know, when you get really good, how much you kick it back to society, and I think we see that in in certain forms. I get more concerned, not so much of what these companies are going to do, but what are what is grocery retail and and retail in general going to do to innovate. And I know that's very difficult when your margins are 3%, your error, uh, your margin of error is very, very slim and anything you do yep. may be like, <clears throat> scrutinized like crazy. Or even more concern is the social responsibility Facebook has in its dominant voice and controlling a platform that, what is it, how many users now? 3 billion maybe? Yeah, at least, at least. That can, that, that, then, fundamentally concerns me how it can be used to half the planet just just a fundamentally shift the thinking of people that that starts to concern mm -hmm. me right yeah um yeah i mean there's so there's like crazy things happening in 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 the world and guess what guys listen, it's not going to get any better no i know <clears throat> listen i i know this you know we got one other topic we wanted to, yeah, to go ahead us, which is um you know our friends at instacart announced uh, another round of, of um, money being raised. Yeah, I think their valuation now is over seventeen billion yeah. U.S. Seventeen billion, yeah. So it's impressive. Yeah. Well, impressive growth, right? And I think it's yeah. they went from a previous valuation of thirteen, I want to say thirteen point six, thirteen point point eight, up to um, seventeen, which I think is is fundamentally tied to the to the growth that anyone that's in e-commerce is seeing today. Um, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Listen, I get excited when any tech company is doing well, is raising capital, and is fundamentally trying to just kind of kind of change. Um, they recently had an article on them, on Progressive Grocer, uh, with mm -hmm. uh, their president, Neelam. And they, they, it's funny because they see their, their business model as being kind of four facets, four sides. So you have the consumer, the retailer, the CPG, and then the personal shopper. I cannot imagine the challenges of kind of creating that equation that balances out all of those four four sides to it. So it'll be interesting to kind of see what happens in their continued partnership with grocery retail. And yeah. we're not, you know, I'm not hearing a lot about shift in the market. You know, no. The marketing no. has kind of quieted down. I think the other the news really is about Uber. Mm. You've seen the Uber Eats commercials on TV. Yes. Uh, we do know that Instacart was able to get uh, Uber to um, basically correct their ways right. uh, as far as corner shop was concerned. Yeah, and that's you know I hate to say this we we live this at Mercatus. Yeah, uh, where we're constantly blocking people from scraping data. Trying yeah. to, anyways, uh, and, and when I say data, it's like product images, you know, and, and just trying to stop those people from from doing those things, and it's not easy. I mean, I'm one. I remember at one point, 
um, these the servers were coming from Microsoft Azure. So yeah. guess what we did? We <laughs> we fundamentally blocked anything coming from Microsoft. It is it is because at the end of the day, it, it's theft. I mean, sure. I mean, the product image data, you know, we, we don't produce all of it. And we, we subscribe to data uh, providers in order to li we license that data for the benefit of our retailers. I understand that Instacart um, also took some proprietary imaging, yeah. which has which has a cost to it. You know, it's 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 not a good business practice. Yeah. And this is and this is goes back to like the whole conversation on IT, right? Fundamentally, any individual in business has a right to protect their intellectual property. So, like, yeah. why wouldn't you? So, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in grocery um, leading up to Thanksgiving. <laughs> I, it's, yeah, I it's, it's going to be it's going to be a interesting fall. It's going to be. I got to think, Mark. It's this should be like a big, big, you know, bonus Thanksgiving for a lot of retailers. People not going out to restaurants. Yeah kind of staying local, staying with their families. I got to assume it's going to be good. Yeah, I mean, assume we just had the Canadian Thanksgiving. I I don't know what the numbers were in terms of uh, grocery retail. I guess those will come out in a few weeks. But you're right. I, I do get a sense a lot of people were uh, staying at home and, and spending it with a very close family unit. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's the same thing's going to happen in the U.S. Yeah, I was actually told that uh, Canadian turkey sales were down. Really? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's that's uh, true, but I overheard it from one Canadian grocery retail executive. Interesting. It's the first year that turkey sales are down. I guess um, fewer people got in gathering and having smaller uh, smaller dinners. Yeah. If it, or if any. Well, we ended up buying, you know, pre-sliced, pre-cut turkey at a at a place for for two people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So, Mark, how do people get to like this show? They can hit the subscribe button. They can hit the like button on digitalgrocer.com. That would be the easiest way. You know, follow our YouTube channel. Follow us on social media. All right. And they can always reach you at uh, sylvan.perrier at mercatus.com and me at uh, mark.fairhurst at mercatus.com. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on this uh just Mark and I show, I guess you could call it that. <laughs> and then we went, wow, normally it's 30 minutes. We went, wow, wow, we went for we went, 47 went minutes. An hour. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. That's Folks, awesome. thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Peace.